so well, cool. when I was asking Spirit what to talk about today, the really what came through is everybody's broken, you know, and it's what we do with those broken pieces that matter. And every day we have a choice in front of us, you know, and notice the wording on it. It was everybody's broken. So you can either take the pieces and become art, not make art, become art. Or you can take those pieces and cut yourself and others. Those are the two choices that you have. You can either take the pieces and become art, or you're going to get cut a lot by your own brokenness. And you're going to accidentally, maybe, hopefully accidentally, cut everyone around you. You're going to hurt them by your brokenness. And so the question becomes, what are we going to do about it? You know, what, what are our choices here? What are our responsibilities here? What are we going to do? And so the, the sitting down and channeling this, what Spirit said is, remember, healing is a choice. You cannot drag someone to healing. You cannot force them into healing. We can't push, pull, twist their arm. Really, we cannot force someone into healing. But even though healing is a choice, hurting those around you, even yourself, that's really not a choice. It's really not okay. You could say, well, if you're choosing not to heal, that's your choice, that's your right, that is okay. But if you're choosing not to heal and then you're turning around and you're taking those broken pieces and you're cutting other people with them, that's not okay. It's not okay. And so really healing, while it's a choice, it also becomes a responsibility. You know, and that's what today we're talking about. Like, how, what do we do? What do you do? And the first thing to recognize is everybody's broken. This is life on earth. You know that saying, nobody gets out of it alive. Enjoy your life. Nobody gets out of it alive. Guess what? Nobody gets through it unbroken. Our greatest spiritual teachers on this planet are fantastic spiritual teachers. Why? Because they were broken. No one in that position has had a perfect life. I mean, we all know how much I love Louise Hay. And we know that she did really find a peaceful, loving place. But her her early years weren't like that. She was very broken. What about those around us? And, you know, sometimes we can get this idea that my brokenness is so much more than yours. Mm -hmm. That, well, you know, you might be a little broken, but I'm really broken. And when we start comparing our traumas, we all lose. We all lose. There's no way to compare them. There's no way to say, well, actually, my trauma is worse than you. Or her trauma is worse than his. Because you, the moment you start comparing them, then you start assigning them a value. You, value is to us, not to the traumas that we've gone through. And we have to remember that on some level, you know, we're here to grow as a soul. So a lot of the things that we go through are for that purpose. Therefore, our own evolution, therefore, our own soul growth, they're to help us along the way. How many times I see people that they literally, both hands are frozen. Both hands are frozen because they have grabbed onto their brokenness and they're holding onto their trauma and they're saying, look what so-and-so did to me. Look what the world did to me. Look what this did to me. And if your hands are locked up because you're clenching onto that brokenness so tightly, then that's all you're becoming are fragments of yourself. And you're cutting yourself with your own brokenness. And I guarantee you, you're cutting everyone around you. You're hurting people. And so it becomes our responsibility to honor everybody's broken. Everybody's broken. And, you know, we can get so myopic in our ability to see that we only look at our own traumas. And we look at, well, you know, poor me, poor me. I've had such a hard life, poor me. I promise you there's someone who's had a worse one. I promise you. And something I have to be very mindful of as I'm doing the the speaking and the teaching on the divine feminine is not to make masculine my enemy. Men, masculinity are not my enemy. So as much as I want to teach about being part of the divine feminine, I have to remember that I teach through love, but I don't make someone my enemy, right? Why? Because then I'm cutting them with my brokenness. The moment you make someone your enemy that really and truly hasn't personally done something to you, you've made them your enemy and you've cut them with your brokenness and you've caused them damage. So if I walk around as a feminist, okay, 
if I walk around as someone who is saying, you know, women, we had to struggle to get the right to vote. We had to struggle to get access to birth control. We had to struggle to do these things. But I look at this man sitting here as the cause of that. I have cut him and me with my brokenness. The only way we heal is to let go and become art with the pieces and not keep them broken. Let them become part of something, some beautiful part of us that tells our story. Your brokenness can become art within you and it can tell your story. It can tell your story of survival. It can tell your story of healing. It can tell your story of beauty. And it can inspire and help others. But we have to remember to become the art. Otherwise, we become the weapon. How many people around us right now have become the weapon? They're just walking triggers, looking for any reason to not just get upset and get offended, but to actually lash out and hurt others. Social media, great example, but also up there on the corner. You know, and we have to do a better job of becoming art. We have to do a better job of letting these pieces tell our story to inspire others and help others and encourage others to heal. And it's not easy. It's not easy in any capacity, but it's, it's what we're here to do, right? And we're here to light the way, light worker. Everyone in this room is a light worker. Everyone in here has the duty of holding light in the darkness. That is what you're here to do. And so you have an even greater sense of responsibility to deal with your own brokenness, to become art, to let those stories become inspiration for not just others, but for yourself. Inspire yourself. Honor what you've been through, what you've gone through, what you still will go through. And know that that becomes a story that inspires you. That you get to take inspiration from your own growth. Be your own spiritual guru. Be your own spiritual teacher. Be the person that you look to when times are rough. Because you know your history. And you know you've gone through worse. And you came out of it. And you you healed yourself. You restored yourself. You recovered yourself. So no matter what this is, your past proves to you that you can do it that you can do it and that you will do it and that you will make those pieces into something else. One thing that, let me back up just slightly before I go there. My day job, psychic medium, I see people in the worst moments of their lives. And I've seen every kind of loss you can imagine, every kind. And I'll tell you, the one that paralyzes me is a parent who loses a child. There is something unnatural about that, that there's not even a word for it. You know, we can be a widow or a widower, or you can be an orphan if, you're, if your parent dies, but there is not a word to describe a parent who has lost a child because it's literally indescribable. So in my, my mind, Leslie's mind, when I'm talking about people comparing grief and how hard they have it, I go back to seeing those people who have lost a child across from me, and those are the pillars of strength I think about because... That is the indescribable loss, in my opinion, that you would, I just don't know. But yet, they get up every day, and they function every day, and they become the shining light for others every single day. And I'm absolutely looking at you, because you're an inspiration, because I cannot imagine a greater loss. But yet, what do you do? You demonstrate that you can still have a relationship with that child in heaven. And that you still get up, and you shine your light, and you find your way. So, in Leslie's mind, whenever we go to that place that we start really feeling sorry for ourselves, or, you know, what's going on with us, comparing trauma, I think about that. I think about those, and it's an instant reality check for me. I think we sometimes need those reality checks. We sometimes need those moments that make us go, okay, well, this is bad. It could be so much worse. It could be so much worse. And even when you want to, even we're, we're talking about this world of comparing traumas, try a parent who lost three children at once. 
I mean, there's always someone who has it worse. So this idea that my trauma, my brokenness is the be all end all and no one will ever understand it because it's just that bad. I'm sorry, that needs to go the hell out the window because that's crazy. That's crazy. But yet we identify, what do we do? We take our hands and we lock them on our trauma. And we say, no one will ever, ever, ever understand this because it's mine. You know what? I promise you somebody's been through it. I promise you they've been through it. And I promise you they probably, someone's had worse. And we all need that perspective sometimes. And I always say, don't compare traumas. But sometimes in certain situations, what you need is someone to give you some perspective. If you can't get there yourself, you need a friend to shake you and say, you need to wake up because this could be worse. And if that's the thing that gets you to snap out of it, then that's fine. That's why there's no cookie cutter healing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why there's no cookie cutter healing. And we all are broken. Every single one of us. And I want you to think about how old of a being you are. How many lifetimes you've had. In love church, we believe in reincarnation. It's kind of a tenet here. You know, I'm not saying you have to to come through the door. I'm just saying... We do. How many times have you been male? How many times have you been female? How many times have you been Christian, atheist, Buddhist, Muslim, Sikh, Baha'i? Those are the main ones I can think of right now. How many times have you been on a different continent? How many times have you been in Europe, in Africa, in Australia, in North America, South America, Asia? How many different religions, how many different races, how many different languages, how many different cultures, how many different ways have you been? Guess what? We've probably all been straight and gay. Honestly. We've probably all been murdered and a murderer. We've probably all stolen something. We've probably and, and we've probably all been enslaved or part of that system on the other side. We've probably all been tortured and the one doing the torturing. We're old beings. We've had many, many, many lifetimes. How do you get to be an old soul? You go through all the steps to get there. You go through all the steps. And so this lifetime for you is about shining the light for where the culmination of your lifetimes has brought you. Has brought you. My personal thought is, you know, the people that are advocating against same-sex marriage. You know, the people that are out there, it's an abomination, it's sinful. My personal thought is they were probably gay in another lifetime, and maybe they were even killed for it, or they were ostracized for it, or they were tortured for it, or they had to live in fear and shame their whole lives. So now they're working that out in the way that they can. Yeah. We, if we look for patterns for people, we will see that they're just continuations of their story. And so we have to be willing to look beyond this one lifetime and the brokenness we're clinging on to. Because the truth is, if we didn't make art ourselves into art from those pieces four lifetimes ago, guess what? They're still in here cutting us. You know, they're still in here cutting us. And this really wasn't going to be a past life talk, but Spirit's given me one example. There was a woman who came to see me. And she's actually going to be an Archbishop Wise book. He interviewed her for it, which was a little surprising that she agreed. But she agreed, and her medical doctor agreed. So when I go in to see her, she looks just pretty normal, like any one of us. But psychically, when I open my eyes at her, she's like this. And I'm like, what is happening here? This is really weird. So I get into her Akashic record and start looking, and she had been hung to death. And that was the, where the rope was. And so I'm like, whoa, okay, well, okay, that's, it's a past life. We can, we can remove this. So I get to work on her, and it was one of the most intense healings I've ever experienced. I, I don't even want to go into the details, but what I will say is it took a long time. It was extremely intense for all of us. But this incurable condition called cervical dystonia, which the only reason she looked like this was because she had so much Botox. Without Botox, she walked around like this. So basically, this woman was reliving her hanging constantly. And so through doing the past life release and what? Getting her to let go of the brokenness. We were able to heal that lifetime and her cervical dystonia, a condition that does not heal, does not cure, and does not resolve, has been deemed resolved for four years now. 
No more morphine, no more Botox. That's so amazing. So why? Because she was carrying a trauma from another lifetime that she didn't let go of, she was still doing this, that was literally poisoning her body and her mind and her spirit and her soul. And by let, helping her let go of the very rope, right, that was hanging her, she was able to become art. And now she is a living, breathing testament of divine healing. Because this, I, she had a watch that would tell her when to take her morphine. Because the pain was that severe. No quality of life, no driving, no working, no functioning. She now drives, she now works, she now functions. No morphine, no Botox. She lives a pretty decent life, you know. But it was the brokenness and the holding on to it. Now, I, I, I completely agree it's unfair that your brokenness comes from another lifetime. But what will happen is this lifetime will create circumstances and conditions that will recreate the trauma. And if you deal with this trauma, it heals that trauma. But she didn't know where to even begin. So we went back to the original soul fracture because that's what that was. That was a soul fracture. And so it's important that we look at this when we're dealing with people who are broken. So many times they're not angry about the thing they think they're angry about. They're angry about a soul fracture that maybe happened five lifetimes ago and is repeated for the previous five lifetimes. But until we're willing to let go of the trauma, let go of the pain that is cutting us and those we love wide open and embrace those pieces and make them art within us, we just stay stuck. And everybody's broken. Everybody, you, me, everyone in this room, all of us are broken. None of us are wholly intact as a soul from the beginning. It wouldn't be life on earth if that were, if that were possible. Someday, someday we will be able to get there. Why? Because we're continuing to deal with our brokenness. We're continuing to look at where am I triggered? Where am I triggered? What are my triggers? What, what gets me angry that my reaction is not proportionate to the act itself? What does it? And then we have to look at wh where that comes from. Most of the time, you'll find something in your lifetime that can explain it. Something. An experience as a child. An experience in elementary school. An experience as a teenager. Fine. Go there. Understand it's probably deeper than that. But if you heal it here, you heal it there. So you don't have to be an Akashic Records reader or a past life expert to heal this stuff. Go to where it is in this lifetime. That's enough. And the other thing, too, is, you know, just remember that it's everybody. All of us are broken. Every single one of us. Okay, now those soul fractures, think of it like once you fracture, that piece of you breaks off, you know, and it floats out there, or in some cases it even attaches to somebody, or in some cases it goes to heaven with our loved one. So when it's time to reintegrate those pieces of our soul, it's kind of putting a jigsaw puzzle back together. Okay, one thing you should do every single day, place your hands over your heart and say, it is safe for me to be whole. Mm -hmm. It is safe for me to be whole. Mm -hmm. It is safe for me to be whole. And just envision all these pieces of you all across lifetimes and times and space, all of these parts of you come back and integrate and you breathe it in and you're whole. You breathe in your wholeness. You breathe in your healing. I also really like that this. I will hold my hands like this, and I will let go. That's okay. As close as you can get is good. So that means you really can't grasp onto your things. Whew. Let it go. You know, you can still hold on to things like this. So, yeah, just dump it. It is. It's about letting go of the pieces that are cutting you wide open. Letting them reintegrate and become the art of your story. The art that you use to not only inspire others, but inspire yourself. Because that's what it's here for. Okay? Now, the mirror effect. This is a really good tool. And it's often, you know, I mean, it's, 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 yeah. People can misuse this tool a lot. And, you know, you, you hear them do it. You say, well, I'm walking down the street, 
And this guy walks up and he punches me in the head. And then you hear someone say, well, he was a mirror, so how do you want to hit yourself? I don't know that I'm going to say it works right there. <laughs> if you're assaulted, I'm just going to say that's, that's not your mirror. Um, it could be other things. could be karmic. But I don't think it's because you want to hit yourself in the head, so you attract someone to come and hit you in the head. But the mirror is always showing you back where you're broken. Okay? And this is oftentimes in very difficult to see ways because it's it's a feeling it's not a like a logical thought no it's a feeling you know um my big thing this whole lifetime has been about holding boundaries holding boundaries my trigger and my mirror is when i perceive that someone is not honoring a boundary Whew. i get mad fast real mad fast because that's my mirror so if my mirror is reflecting to me that you're not honoring my boundary or my friend's boundary or my kid's boundary or my husband's boundary that's my trigger that's my brokenness like this so i'm going to take those pieces and i'm going to cut myself wide open and i'm going to blood dripping from both hands and then i'm going to turn around and cut anyone else that i perceive that's not holding those boundaries when the easier thing to do is to let them go see it for what it is it's a message from me to me that no one can violate my boundaries if I don't let them I do not have to have an expectation that someone is going to be kind to me or an expectation that they're going to be loving it's my expectations that get me in trouble because see I expect that if I'm kind and loving other people will be as well so that expectation that people are going to be fair but you know is that fair to expect someone to be that way no but if they're not, do they have the right to be in your life? No. Answer is no. So look for the mirror. What is triggering you? What is getting you? What is coming through you? That's how we know where we have to heal. That's where we know where the next phase of work has to do. And if you need to, there's a song. It's um, We sang it a lot at Morningstar, but we also sang it at Unity sometimes. And it's called I Release and I Let Go. Is that by a Karen Drew? I think she's got one. I think Michael Gott has one as well. And um, I, I, re I love everything by Karen Drucker, but I also really like Gott. I'm um, G-O-T-T. -T. Anyway, and it, he's, whenever I would sing it, I would, hold, I, I would say, I release and I let go and just let those arms just fling open. You know, anything that no longer serves me, I've got it right here, right here, and I release and I let go. And I just push it away, you know, symbolically. I would just push it away. So even when I'd be singing the song, I'd be standing in the, in the pew like this. And I go, I release. I just let my hands go. I release and I let go. I release and I let go. And that's it. That's what we do. We have to be willing to let go of the broken pieces and let them reintegrate in us as art so that we can do what we came here to do. And... One thing you will see is as you do this, as you let go of those broken pieces, as you let them become the art of your story, you become much more comfortable in you. You become comfortable in your own body and in your own life, in your own being. And that is something that, honest to God, we're not very much. We're constantly out there, you know, looking for the right external thing to help us be comfortable in here. And if you watch makeup ads, it's makeup. If you watch hair ads, it's hair. If you watch the Kardashians, you just need a whole new life. Because <laughs> nothing about you is going to matter. It's going to be good enough. Right? So all of these ways are trying to sell you comfort in your own being. But why aren't you comfortable in your own being? It's because you're holding on to the brokenness that's cutting you. And if we can learn to let those pieces become art within us, we don't need anyone, not even the Kardashians, to tell us how to be comfortable in our own skin, to tell us how to be, how to live, how to think, how to feel, how to ascend, how to heal. Food for thought is that you can become magnificent art. Every broken piece tells a story. Don't be ashamed of any of it. So many fabulous teachers 
and leaders and writers and speakers on this planet have stories of brokenness. So whether that story is addiction, whether that story is a lack of self-love that led to behavior that you now don't like, that you engaged in, whether that story means that you were, you know, bitter and angry or a victim, that can become beautiful art if you let it. Uh, for years, because I was, I was just the biggest victim, MS at 20, you know, full scholarship to law school, didn't get to go. Then, you know, MS, RA, fibro, then lupus, chronic fatigue, synergistic pain, Then we added some ulcerative colitis, and then an ulcer. By the way, almost all of those are autoimmune. Nobody had a worse day than me. Oh, and then the bone marrow condition that was like cancer. I wore that victim energy as a badge of pride for the love of God. I was the best little victim on the planet. My email address was mom with MS at AOL.com, because I was an MS-er, and we fought the monster, and you capitalized M and S in monster. And, you know, we had our own language and our own sense of identity, and there was a, what was, what's the MS one? Not Race for the Cure, but there's an MS one, too, that I can't remember the name of it. The, it was an MS walk. MS walk. There it is. Um, you know, we got our own magazines. You know, we were a tight community, because we all battled the same demon, MS. And same thing with fibro, by the way. <laughs> so fibro had all the same things. So did RA, right? So does ulcerative colitis. And I, lucky me, I got to be a member of all these groups, but I could only have one email. So it was just mom with MS. <laughs> I held on to this so tightly that it stole over a decade of my life. Until the moment I decided to let those pieces become art. And that's what you see every single day. And I hope it's good. I try every day to make it good. I try every day to let those pieces become an amazing art story instead of, hey, look at me, I'm a victim. And so you have the ability, no matter what those decisions were, no matter how much you wish they weren't there, they're your story. They're your art. Let it shine. Let it inspire others and let it inspire you. Namaste. You're a shining mosaic. Yes, you are. Yes, you are, ma'am.